Hi, and welcome back to this Tuesday edition of Focal Point AAFR Talk. I encourage you, by the way, if you've been encouraged, you've been motivated, you've been instructed, you've been galvanized, you have gotten engaged in the culture war, you have grown in your relationship with God because of your exposure to Focal Point and AFR Talk, we would love to hear from you. I'd like to record your listener testimony for use in our share which is coming up October 22 through 24. So you can call this number. This is also the number you can call to sign up to be a share volunteer. So I'm going to give the number and give you the two extensions you can use to get to the various options. If I make a note of this number, I'll come back to it in a second. It's 800-326-4543. Write that down somewhere. Punch it into your phone because that's the number for the general number for AFA. 800-326-4543. Now, if you'd like to record a listener testimony about what AFR has meant to you, just press option 8. So you dial that number, 800-326-4543. Hit option 8. Now, if you would like to sign up to be a share volunteer, we go for three days, Tuesday to Thursday, October 22 through 24. You can pick the day. You can pick the shifts. You can pick as many shifts or as few shifts as you would like. We have people coming from Kansas and Texas and all over the Fruit of Plain to participate. Call the same number, 800-326-4543, and hit extension 204, and Deanna will be happy to help you Find a ship that works for you. You can also go to AFR.net and sign up. Now, number to call, 888-589-8840 is the number, 888-589-8840. Now, some people, I think Republicans have miscalibrated as to why President Obama refuses to negotiate. Jeff, do you have that audio bite of President Obama saying that? There's a simple reason why Barack Obama flatly, stubbornly, and childlessly, childishly refuses to negotiate. Now, here's what he said. I will not negotiate on anything. Let's re- let, Jeff, let's play that one more time. This is President Obama on this whole idea of negotiation. I will not negotiate on anything. All right, so he says, I'm not going to negotiate on anything. I'm not going to negotiate on Obamacare. I'm not going to negotiate on the budget. I'm not going to no- negotiate on the debt ceiling. And I think that Republicans have misunderstand the president here. And if they continue in their misunderstanding of the president, he is going to be able to play them for chumps. Now here is, here's what I mean by this. President Obama does not fear an economic meltdown. He craves an economic meltdown. He doesn't want to try to avoid an economic meltdown. He wants to precipitate an economic meltdown. He wants one because for him, it's a twofer. If he can get an economic meltdown, he accomplishes two things. He gets to cross two things off of his bucket list. Number one, he can bring down the American economy. I think he has a deliberate intentional plan uh, or intentional design, purpose, drive, desire to destroy the American economy. So he thinks if he can precipitate a budget crisis, he can precipitate a debt ceiling crisis, it will cause the American economy to crumble. As I'll explain in a minute, he's not right about that, but he thinks he is. And as long as the Republicans think that's what will happen, then he's got them over a barrel. He's got all uh, the leverage. And he also thinks that he can destroy the GOP at the same time. So he will destroy America and he will destroy his political opponents all at the same time. This is a twofer for him. He can destroy America and destroy the Republican Party all in one shot. That's why he craves an economic meltdown. He's doing everything in his power to precipitate a fiscal uh, crisis. So he's hoping that the uh, American economy will fall apart. He's hoping that America is going to blame the GOP for this with the help of the lapdog, the poodle uh, media, even though we all know that he's the one at Uh, that's at fault. He's hoping that the media will be his little sycophants and that the American people will believe the swill and the bilge that they hear from the mainstream media. And that's what we heard in the last segment. Carl Bernstein, the guy from Huffington Post, they're complaining the media is not doing its job. The media is supposed to be out there pulling the wool over the eyes of the American people and convincing them that all of this is the Republicans' fault and they uh, aren't buying it. So President Obama wants to cross those two items off of his bucket list, destroy America, 
destroy the Republican uh, Party. And until the Republican Party understands what his end game is here, what his ultimate goal is, they're not going to be in a position to call uh, his bluff. Now, this goes back to something we visited before. President Obama has a fundamental and visceral antipathy for America as it was founded. Every time he travels to a foreign country, he illustrates this because he blames America for every global evil known to man and known to human history. So he thinks America is the source of evil uh, in the world. And I believe he is driven by a commitment, by this intense desire to punish America for being racist to its core. He thinks that racism is in America's DNA, and because it is in our DNA, it can't be rooted out. It's not like something you can treat with antibiotics and clear up. It's not something that can be surgically removed because it's in the DNA. It can't be cured. It can't be eradicated. Therefore, it must be destroyed. America, as it was founded, must be destroyed because it is imperialistic and racist to the core. So that's his big picture. That's what he's uh, driving at. So he's got, I believe, this perverse desire, this perverse drive to bring America down by weakening us abroad and by doing intentional harm to our economy at home. It's part of the punishment, and I believe he feels called to be the agent of retribution, the agent of wrath to punish America for our imperialism and our racism. So he may be out there making clucking noises uh, in some effort to convince the American people that he really wants to solve our budget problems. He really wants to avert the debt ceiling crisis. He's going to want to try to paint that impression. But the truth is he doesn't want anything of the sort. I believe, he believes, and I think he hopes secretly and he hopes fervently that the government shutdown and the crisis over the debt ceiling will reduce our economy to rubble. He's hoping that all of these apocalyptic predictions will come true. He wants to bring America to his knees, and I think he salivates over that prospect. doesn't bother him. He delights in the prospect. So until the GOP understands that this is what he wants, they're not going to be in any position to respond with any strength or firmness, uh, and he will continue to be able to play Republicans for chumps. So the truth is that, the, uh, that the, the, despite the president's bloviations, we do not need America to fear either a government shutdown or a failure to raise the debt ceiling. And once we understand that, then he loses all of his leverage. He has no leverage. He has no power. He has no control. If Republicans and the American people understand that we do not need to be afraid of a government shutdown, we do not need to be afraid of not raising uh, the debt ceiling. Now, you look at the shutdown. We are, what, day eight into the shutdown. It hasn't been Armageddon unless you count the spouses of the vets that died in Afghanistan or the vets trying to visit the World War II Memorial or the vets trying to visit the Normandy Memorial or the foreign tourists at Yellowstone Park. All of those manufactured, those are deliberately inflicted. Nothing necessary about those whatsoever. But there has been no uh, Armageddon as a result, no apocalyptic results of the government uh, shutdown. In fact, we, we're finding out now that 85% of the government is running flat, uh, wide open. So all of those apocalyptic predictions that we heard from the president and other naysayers have not come to pass. And we don't need to fear a refusal to raise the debt ceiling. All this posturing about default is just gas because revenues are going to continue to stream into the federal government unabated we keep working. We keep sending in our withholding all this money, $2.7 trillion worth, 200 and some billion dollars every month just rolls in to the federal government coffers. And it takes less than 10% of that, of that revenue flood, to service the debt. There is absolutely no reason whatsoever, whatsoever, for America to go into default. The only way it can go into default is not pay service on the debt. It takes less than 10% of revenues which continue to stream in. That means that the only one that can plunge America into default is President Obama if he does another juvenile and petty thing and simply refuses to direct tax revenue to debt service. He's the only one that can trigger a default. Now, even if the debt ceiling is not raised, let's not forget there's still sufficient revenue. This is what Rand Paul said the other day. We can still take care of Social Security. We can still take care of Medicare. We can still take care of the military. And we can service the debt. There's enough ongoing stream of revenue to take care of all 
of those obligations. So what's the worst that can happen? The absolute worst thing that can happen is that if the United States does not raise the debt ceiling on the morning of October 17, we will have a balanced budget by the close of business that day. That is the worst thing that can happen. We'll get a balanced budget out of this. We won't even need a constitutional amendment and all of the debate and all of the, uh, all, all the process that takes. We have an instantaneous balanced budget. We'll have it the day we don't raise the debt ceiling. Now, President Obama, remember on the campaign trail, America's got to start living within its means. We agree. Here's how you do it. Just don't raise the debt ceiling. And America, in nine days from now, nine days from now, America can begin to live within its means. You know, as I mentioned, America is going to have $2.7 trillion in revenue coming in. And I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if you cannot find a way to run a country on $2.7 trillion, you need to quit and give your job to somebody who can. So the economy is not going to collapse. America is not going to go into default. The sun will rise on October 18. So in other words, if the Republicans are thinking clearly here, they'll recognize that President Obama is all bark and no bite. He is all pettiness and no punch. You know, and the fact that we've got these increasingly hysterical complaints from liberal pundits that the media is not doing its job to be cheerleaders for Obama and pin enough of the blame on the Republicans, it's proof positive that already they realize that they are losing the public debate and they know they are losing the public debate. So, my friends, now is no time for the Republican Party to go weak in the knees or to go wobbly. If the Republican Party sticks to its guns, then it will not be the United States that's brought to its knees, but it could be Barack Obama who is brought to his knees. You listen to Focal Point on AFR Talk. Number to call if you want to join the program, 888-589-8840. We've had some callers waiting patiently. I'll take those coming right out of the uh, break at the bottom of the hour. So stay with us, stay tuned, and we will get uh, we will get to your uh, call. And again, I, I just want to remind Republicans that according to Fox News poll, 58% of the American people would vote against raising the debt ceiling if they could. Just 37% of Americans would vote for it. And Republican lawmakers, 78% of Republicans and 88% of Tea Partiers are against raising the debt ceiling and 57% of independents. It's a winner all the way around. 